Good morning. It's 8.30 on Wednesday, February 16th. I'm Desiree Frazier, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, the road ahead for kids and COVID. And after a Southern Remedy Health Minute, we talk with the professor teaching the state's only critical race theory class. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. The Omicron variant of COVID-19 is on the decline in Mississippi, but doctors say it may take years to fully assess the damage it's done. One COVID after effect that the medical community says it's closely monitoring is multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, or MIS-C. Early evidence indicates the Omicron variant may not trigger the disease as readily as the potent Delta variant of COVID, but it's still too early to tell. Dr. Charlotte Hobbs is a pediatric infectious disease expert at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. She speaks with MPB's Kobe Vance. So over the past few weeks, we've actually continued to see um, severe acute COVID cases in children, either who um, are um, eligible for vaccine and haven't been vaccinated or in children who actually Um, are not eligible for vaccination. Um, We continue to see um, MIC cases, but at a low level at this point, um, it's still um, pretty early for us to be able to tell if we're going to see those um, spikes as we saw with um, MIC after the Delta wave, for example. Um, But so far, we've actually seen just a handful of cases um, each week so far. When children come to the hospital with MISC, what what is it like for them? What What does the disease look like whenever they get there? So usually these children um, have had um, fever for at least 24 hours. Their symptoms can be pretty um, varied in terms of how they present. Um, And in fact, um, they usually present about four to six weeks after community peaks of um, COVID spread. Um, And oftentimes um, they may not have had symptoms during their initial infection. Um, But these children actually, when they come to the hospital, um, some of their initial symptoms, like I said, are quite varied, but they include fever and they may have um, sort of nonspecific complaints of not feeling well. Um, Sometimes they'll actually have um, sort of GI complaints or complaints of um, stomach discomfort um, and some, you know, vomiting or diarrhea. Um, The symptoms are pretty nonspecific. Um, When children do have um, MIC, though, they do actually progress um, and get um, very sick very quickly. Um, And so they can actually um, develop, um, you know, low blood pressures that require um, pressor support um, very quickly. And they actually can look very quickly um, sick, sort of comparably to how a child who has septic shock could look. Um, So again, they they present sort of with these nonspecific vague symptoms. They may not have had a clear antecedent illness with COVID, um, but they can actually get sick quite quickly. And I think the other important thing to note is that children who develop MIC, for the most part, are actually children who are previously healthy. You mentioned that MIS-C tends to you know, pop up a lot more commonly about four to six weeks after community peak, uh, the community transmission has peaked. You know, We're nearing that mark right now. And what are y'all preparing for at the hospital for this next few weeks to look like? We've actually um, revised our guidelines for MISC according to the most um, up-to-date information um, per CDC and the American College of Rheumatology and the American Academy of Pediatrics Resources. Um, Again, we at this point, fortunately, have a better idea of how to care for these children, certainly than we did when we first um, started seeing these cases. There's such a dramatic difference in terms of our ability to um, identify these cases and also um, aggressively treat them. Um, So we basically are ready now because we've had, you know, significant amount of experience um, with taking care of children with MIC. Um, And in addition, we are better able to um, think about this diagnosis and recognize it early on and Recognizing this diagnosis um, early on is not easy, but it is so important and integral in being able to make sure that these children have um, a very good chance at um, recovering well. What would be your messaging to parents right now on the importance of, you know, vaccines as we see the pandemic begin to decline in this current surge, uh, but, you know, possibly looking ahead to endemic surges as well as, you know, maybe a sixth surge in the coming weeks? 
I think that um, because we know that um, COVID can be severe in um, children, although not as commonly, but certainly with Omicron, we are seeing more of these upper airway manifestations, which can be more severe in children. Um, and also um, in parallel to that, we know that we can see MIC, but we don't know which children will actually develop that. I think it's important to reiterate to parents that there is a um, safe and effective vaccine that's available for children down to the age of five that actually can protect them. And, you know, we keep talking about um, the debate over masks, and we all know that masks can and do reduce um, the transmission of SARS-CoV-2 or the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, but we're seeing other parts of the country who are able to relax some of their restrictions, particularly because their vaccination rates are really quite, quite good in the community. Um, and we don't have that situation, unfortunately, in Mississippi, in which we have, you know, a large proportion of our population being successfully vaccinated. We have a ways to go. Um, and that's particularly true in children, especially true of children um, down for the new authorization age, which is five to 11. So I think that the important advice to parents is the sooner we would like to A, make sure that our children are protected from potentially severe outcomes from this disease. Again, knowing that we can't predict sometimes even who will actually get very sick from a severe acute COVID itself, um, in addition to MIC. Um, if we really want to get um, our children protected and safe, um, point A is get your child vaccinated if they're eligible. Point B is make sure that all of those in the family who are eligible for vaccination can get vaccinated because, again, we can see severe outcomes either with acute COVID or MISC in children. Um, and point C is if we really want to get to the sort of part of this pandemic where we can really think about the word normal, um, quote unquote, then we have to actually um, get vaccinated and do what we can to protect ourselves. I think, again, the other thing that's important to mention is that, you know, every few months we're going through a new wave with new variants. We will continue to have new variants as long as we have susceptible populations who are not vaccinated. So this will continue to go on where we have these peaks of transmission and then children getting sick uh, and potentially getting very sick and even potentially dying as long as we have a incompletely vaccinated population. So the message to parents is if you would like to protect your children and we'd like to get through this, um, you know, the only way through this is through. Um, and the only way through this is through successfully is with a vaccine. Um, I think the other point to make as a sort of a final um, additional point to that also is that if you want to sort of look at the argument of protecting more vulnerable members of the family in addition to children, i.e. if you have a multi-generational household, I can tell you the number of cases in which children who have gone to school um, where there are you know, heterogeneous approaches to mitigation measures will come home with COVID and then actually you know, elderly um, patients, so for example, grandparents in, in the household um, who may be just, you know, more compromised by nature of their age, but in addition, maybe they have other underlying conditions, then get infected with COVID on top. So it's really a argument to protect not only the children, not only to get through the pandemic and get to some sort of sense of normalcy, but also to protect all the generations that are um, a part of our community. So vaccination for those who are eligible is a very, very um, strong argument that we would continue to make. The other sort of last point to just add to that is also we need to remember we're pretty um, relatively limited in terms of treatments that are available to our um, younger children in terms of being able to give them things that can reduce the chances of severe disease. The monoclonal antibodies are only available right now um, for those ages 12 and up under emergency use authorization. So again, when we talk about children versus adults, we need to remember that factor as well. Dr. Charlotte Hobbs is a pediatrician at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Coming up after a Southern Remedy Health Minute, we talk with the professor teaching the state's only critical race theory class. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. What is critical race theory anyway? 
virtually no one seems to know the answer to that question, but that hasn't stopped plenty of folks from having an opinion on it. A recent bill passed by the Mississippi Senate attempts to ban critical race theory, but the text of the legislation doesn't actually define what critical race theory is. Instead, the bill mandates that no public school or university in the state should teach that any, quote, sex, race, ethnicity, religion, or national origin is inherently superior or inferior, unquote. Democrats in the Senate, who are predominantly black, say the proposed ban would prevent Mississippi educators from teaching about the state's ugly history of racism. Senate Republicans, who are overwhelmingly white, say the ban would instead curtail harmful narratives about race. I spoke with Yvette Butler, who's a professor at the University of Mississippi School of Law. Butler's perspective on the issue is pretty unique because right now she's teaching the only critical race theory class in the state of Mississippi. Critical race theory is actually just another method of legal thought, sort of like feminist legal theory, for example. Uh, It's just another way of examining the way that law and society work together. And specifically, critical race theory came about in the 80s really as a way to uh, further explore continued racial inequality despite the advancements of the civil rights movement. In studying critical race theory, did you find it to be to explain the reason that racism continues? Did it validate why racism is still an issue for you? Yeah, so I think in uh, in studying critical race theory, I think it makes a lot of interesting points about structural racism, about the way that race is socially constructed, um, the role that the law plays in socially constructing race, So, for example, particularly with immigration law, um, over time, you know, like courts have made different decisions about who does and does not count as white for the purposes of naturalization, um, for other legal benefits. And um, so I think it just has a really interesting take on, you know, what, what the law's role is in perpetuating racial inequality. Is there another example that you could give us that as well? That would be really a layman's example for folks. One that I think often resonates with people is this idea of, um, you know, sometimes the law will use this quote unquote reasonable person standard. And so in any given situation, you know, what would a quote unquote reasonable person do in the same circumstances you're in? And so, for example, in, um, a policing context, you know, if you are challenging the fact that a police officer has searched your belongings, you know, they might say, oh, well, a reasonable person in your circumstances would be seen to have consented to whatever the police were trying to do. Similarly, I think from a critical race theory perspective, one of the things that I think often hold against, held against some defendants is the fact that they may have run from the police. And in a reasonable person standard, critical race theorists often ask why something like fleeing the police can be used as evidence of guilt as opposed to evidence of fear. And so really bringing in more information about, no, like it really does matter who somebody is and what their circumstances are. And this reasonable person is completely made up or assumes a certain standard that just is not reflective of um, everyday reality. Well, from what I've heard, there are people who don't like it but can't explain it. Do you know what's behind that? I think it is a really interesting phenomenon when people hate something that they can't explain. Um, Unfortunately, I think it fits into this broader context of anti-intellectualism and alternative truths and just not caring what the truth actually is. But then I feel like there are people who, in order to hold on to their, their political power, you know, like this is just another, another school of thought um, that has been sort of 
demonized to meet political ends. So students who were reluctant to take your class and then take it, what do they say to you as they move through the course? Yeah, so I think um, one thing that I've always been really proud of is, you know, when students, whether they, well, and I, I should say that the class is an elective. And so really I get people who are interested, maybe don't know anything about the class or maybe um, have heard lots of negative things and just want to learn for themselves. And I think they all come through it with a broader perspective on what the law can look like, um, the different ways that inequality happens um, to different groups, because again, it's not just black and white. Um, And so I think they come out with a fuller appreciation of the way that the law has worked and the way that it can work in furtherance of justice. So in teaching the class and talking to people and talking to your colleagues, what have you determined about the issue of race that makes it so difficult for people to talk about? So I think one of the things that comes up often is this idea of shame or guilt about the past and, you know, this idea that if we could just move beyond Uh, or stop talking about the things that this country has done wrong, uh, that then everything would be better. (laughs) Um, And, you know, I think one reaction to that is to say, you know, well, don't feel badly, or another reaction is it's not about you. But um, one thing that I'm really leaning into is, yes, like you can – feel badly. This isn't about you. It, this isn't about trying to make you feel badly. But I think negative moments in history often make a lot of us feel sick or shocked or sad um, or ashamed. And that's okay. And we should feel those feelings. But ultimately, you know, various legal theories like critical race theory are asking, well, what what can we do to make the law better? Like, what can we do to make the law work for everybody um, so we don't have to be ashamed? The Mississippi legislature passed a bill to say that no one should be taught in such a way that they feel inferior or superior to another person. How do you teach... American history, Japanese internments, slavery, people coming to this country who at different points in time, different ethnic groups were considered less than. How do you teach history? I mean, again, I think that, yes, like there, you know, when you teach history, you find various times uh, and various places where whoever the ruling class is, does try to institutionalize, you know, like whether very specifically through law or the way that the law is enforced, um, try to institutionalize this hierarchy. Um, But really, if anything, I think talking about history, talking about what has happened and why can bring us to a place where we no longer have any sort of enforced racial hierarchies. And we're never actually going to see how they come into being and see how they're perpetuated without talking about it. Do you see us getting to that point? I hope so. In all practicality? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I I like to remain optimistic <laughs> about the future and you know, try not to speculate and just, you know, hope that we all do what we can to make sure that we do get to that future. Is there anything that I didn't ask you that's important to point out about critical race theory? Um, Your thoughts, what we've discussed, anything? Yeah, I mean, I think the last thing that I'd want to say is, again, um, critical race theory, to my knowledge, has is not and has not ever been taught in K 
through 12. Um, really what the focus on K through 12 has been from my perspective is just making sure that kids get a complete and accurate account of history. Um, and from my perspective as a law professor, um, I really want kids to be getting an adequate social studies education so that they are not at a competitive disadvantage with kids from anywhere else in the nation um, because it will ultimately hold them back if they are unprepared. And I suppose the the final final thing <laughs> that I like that I'd want to share is um, again critical race theory is just another method of legal thought, just like feminist legal theory, just like law and economics, is just looking at the law through a particular lens and teaching lawyers how to see issues from multiple perspectives is what makes them strong attorneys. All right. Well, Professor Yvette Butler with the University of Mississippi, we appreciate you so much in taking the time to explain this very complicated and controversial issue with us to give us insight into what it means in the academic sense. Thanks so much for having me. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Stick around for a full morning of Mississippi Radio. Coming up at 9, it's Fix It 101. Then at 10, it's Everyday Tech. And at 11, don't miss Southern Remedy. Find past installments of this and other Think Radio shows online at mpbonline.org. I'm Desiree Frazier. We'll see you tomorrow morning at 8.30 for the next Mississippi Edition only on MPB Think Radio. Have a good day. 